deadly heat waves, massive wildfires, storms, floods, and droughts. And climate change is just getting started. Who is responsible for this destruction? After 21 long years in their sixth assessment report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has enough evidence to fully and finally confirm it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. The scientists are letting us know that there is no question, doubt, or ambiguity that humans are responsible for climate change. Many have called the IPCC's sixth assessment report the final and the starkest warning about the climate change catastrophe. Let us delve into the report and look at everything it covers. There is a lot of critical information that has largely remained unexplored and unexplained. Without this information, we are charting the course of our future with an incomplete map. We'll first briefly go over the facts in the report that are commonly known. Then, we'll look at everything the report covers that most people might not know about. Finally, we'll examine what could be done given this new information. Let's start with the basics. Greenhouse gas emissions. Since the 1750s, humans have increased greenhouse gas emissions by 47% for CO2 and 156% for methane. These greenhouse gases act like a blanket for the Earth. They trap the heat from incoming sunlight and warm our planet, global warming. Since the 19th century, the Earth has warmed by 1.09 degrees Celsius, more specifically 1.59 degrees on land and 0.99 degrees at sea. The more greenhouse gases we release into the atmosphere, the warmer our planet becomes. And for every additional degree of global warming, the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events increases. The report gives us three emission scenarios that we could reach by 2100. A low emission scenario, 1 to 1.8 degrees Celsius. Ideally, we'd want to be around here. An intermediate emission scenario, 2.1 to 3.5 degrees Celsius. This is the current trajectory we are on. And a very high emission scenario, 3.3 to 5.7 degrees Celsius. Even with just the warming that has already happened, we are witnessing the first major domino effect of global warming, melting sea ice and glaciers. Arctic ice and mountain and polar glaciers will continue to thaw for decades, even in low emission scenarios, and centuries in the very high emission scenarios. This melting ice, in combination with the warming effects, have a large impact on the ocean. The global mean sea level has already increased by 0.2 meters, and its rate of increase is accelerating. This has resulted in increased frequency and severity of coastal flooding and erosion in low-lying coastal areas. This leads us to the most devastating climate change challenge, extreme weather events. Every city, region, and country in the world will be regularly affected by at least one extreme weather event, increased frequency and intensity of rain, droughts, and heat waves, unreliable monsoon rains, and more tropical storms. Now let's go into the largely unexplored territory of the sixth IPCC report. While greenhouse gas emissions have been increasing since the 1750s, our ocean and land combined have absorbed 56% of our CO2. This means that our ocean and land has helped us mitigate global warming by absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere this whole time. This may sound like good news, but the report warns us that if we continue to release more CO2, the ocean and land will become less effective carbon sinks, so future CO2 emissions will have an even greater greenhouse effect. To add to this, 
There's the CO2 and CH4 released from wetlands, permafrost thaw, and wildfires, which the IPCC largely excluded from their emission scenarios. A less effective ocean and land carbon sink, along with the CO2 released from wetlands, permafrost, and wildfires, means we could expect the global temperature to increase until 2050, even under low emission scenarios. This also means that any future release of greenhouse gases will have consequences for centuries or even millennia. One such consequence is that global warming will cause our climate zones to shift poleward. The Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn have already started expanding to the North and South Poles, respectively. That means that the weather patterns that give rise to deserts in the subtropics and stormy wet weather in the mid-latitudes will move towards the poles. The expansion of the Tropic of Cancer towards the North Pole will have a larger impact. Under all emission scenarios, the Arctic is likely to see a practically sea ice-free September at least once before 2050. A sea ice-free Arctic means even more global warming because there will be no ice to reflect solar heat or absorb carbon. So the absence of the Arctic ice will drastically accelerate the warming of the Northern Hemisphere, leading to permafrost thaw, which will release even more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The report says that this release of permafrost gases will be irreversible at centennial timescales. So how does global warming and melting ice impact our ocean? Over the next 2,000 years, the global mean sea level will rise by 2 to 3 meters at 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, 2 to 6 meters at 2 degrees of warming, and 19 to 22 meters at 5 degrees of warming. Rising sea levels will cause extreme coastal weather events. Once in a century, Category 5 tropical storms could become annual events. Sea level rise and the warming of our oceans will also weaken the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, which regulates much of the Earth's climate. A weakened AMOC means more sea level rise in the Atlantic, increased cooling of the Northern Hemisphere, fewer African and Asian monsoons, and low rainfall in Europe and North America. To make matters worse, remember the CO2 that the ocean is absorbing? This CO2 is making the ocean more acidic. Adding to this, industrial and agricultural runoff pollution is causing our ocean's oxygen levels to drop in many regions. Ocean acidification and deoxygenation are disrupting the productivity of phytoplankton, which is impacting the carbon that could be absorbed by the oceans. This brings us to extreme weather events. While we know heat waves will become more frequent and severe, they will be far worse in urban areas. Pavement, buildings, and concrete surfaces absorb and retain heat making cities warmer than surrounding rural areas. This urban heat island effect will make heat waves more potent and lethal. Apart from heat waves at 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming, Africa, Asia, North America, and Europe will experience more intense rainfall and flooding, and all continents except Asia will face more frequent and severe droughts. The final part of the IPCC report that we want to show does not belong to any of the climate change challenges we have talked about. Volcanic eruption. The report states that there is a likelihood of at least one large explosive volcanic eruption sometime during the 21st century. If such an eruption occurs, the aerosols released will reflect some solar energy and cool the Earth. This will temporarily and partially mask the effects of climate change. However, these aerosols are a double-edged sword. They cause ozone depletion and acid rain. And when the cooling effect wears off, we will witness sudden, rapid warming 
that could have devastating effects. Let's look at what we've learned. Because of our past greenhouse gas emissions, global temperatures and sea levels will continue to rise. The Arctic will be sea ice free at least once. Our oceans will become more acidic and people will have to deal with extreme weather events. This sounds bad, but given the fact that our ocean and land will become less effective in absorbing CO2, and for every additional degree of global warming, these problems become worse, there is still plenty of catastrophe to prevent. So how do we do this? Well, the most straightforward answer is climate change mitigation. Limit global warming by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This includes solutions like carbon capture technology, replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy, forest restoration, and introducing carbon taxes. But as we have highlighted, many of these climate change challenges will continue to impact us, even if we lower emissions. That's why we need climate adaptation. Reduce and respond to the negative impacts of climate change. This includes solutions like flood defenses, growing drought-resistant crops, building climate-resilient cities, and having better disaster management plans for extreme weather events. To implement these mitigation and adaptation solutions, we need the entire world to work together. The IPCC has been warning us since the 90s and many other scientists even before that. But this sixth report is our final warning. Global climate change conferences can no longer be a podium for lip service and false promises. We need our governments and businesses to take meaningful action through both mitigation and adaptation to address every climate change challenge highlighted in the IPCC's report. We cannot afford to settle for anything less. <laughs>